So we started off talking about fields, uh, just kind of a generalization of these modern forces, but we've already mentioned um, Newton's universal gravitational law. And it's not a law. Interestingly enough, um, this equation doesn't hold true. Um, and Newton even knows it in his time. He, uh, when, when he comes up with this equation, we start testing it on some of the things. Well, let me explain. This law, that's, the reason why it's called universal is most people at the time believed that the force of gravity on the Earth was not the same force that kept objects in motion in the heavens. The motion of the planets revolving around the sun is not, they believed, is not, is not the same force as if I were to drop an apple on the, near the surface of the Earth. So this invention of this law, this universal gravitational law, says that everything behaves like this. And I think I've already talked about that. I just wanted to reiterate that. But when we start testing it with some of the celestial bodies in our solar system, it turns out that it doesn't work for the planet Mercury. Mercury doesn't quite behave the way we expect it. It's close, but it's not, it's not close enough for, for, for the purposes of... Um, validifying this this equation um, so it's not a law it's not a law in Newton's time it's only it's not even a, it's not a law now so why is it called a law okay but anyway a quick rundown G universal constant for gravity M mass of one object M mass of two object R squared the distance from the center of those two objects so planet planet distance in between from the centers of those two objects okay that's r and then r remember is uh this r hat is direction notation we're notating which direction r is in this case okay we're saying that that this force is in the direction of r and then we change it with this negative sign saying it's in the opposite direction of r okay just a little bit of notation there um the other equation that follow falls into these modern forces. Now, mind you, they're not modern. And obviously, Newton invented this one, or discovered this one, depending on your point of view. Newton, well, I guess it would be invented because it's not necessarily discovered. Newton in, invented this one. Um, so it's not modern. I mean, you're talking the birth of physics. Boom. We've got this equation floating out of here. Um, the reason why I'm putting it in the modern forces again is to just, because these forces are different than the normal force, than the tension, than what we normally think of gravity, um, than thrust, than all these other ideas. These are field forces. And it turns out these field forces, excuse me, are the real forces in the universe, you know, um, radiating outwards from a point. These fields are really the true forces in the system, are true forces in the universe. So this is one, gravitational. The second one that we're going to cover is electrostatic. Okay, electrostatic is K, Q, Q, R squared, R hat. Remember, R hat is nothing but direction notation. As a matter of fact, you probably will not see that direction notation on any test booklet. Okay, so this is our second law, and it's called Coulomb's law. Um, and Coulomb's law is talking about the interaction between charges. So when we talk about charges, we're talking about properties of protons and electrons. They have a charge. And we know from those properties that electrons re repel electrons and protons re repel protons. Okay? So we're talking about the interaction between charges. Cool? So Coulomb, Coulomb, meter. Now here's the really interesting thing and probably one of the most frustrating things I deal with in physics. Coulomb is not a fundamental unit. It's not. Most people still believe it is. I, I've actually gone on Wikiversity, which is supposed to be considerably better than Wikipedia, and had to make a comment about the fact that somebody had written down, had written down Coulomb as a fundamental unit, as a base unit. It's not. An amp is, which is a Coulomb per second. And we'll talk about what an amp is when we're going into circuits. But it's not a fundamental unit. This is considered an amp second or a coulomb. We're just going to call it coulomb for the, for, the, for the purposes of this conversation. We're just going to say it's a charge unit. Okay. 
Now, the reason why it's not a fundamental unit is because we didn't really understand what carry charges, what were charges. When Ben Franklin is out there with this kite, with his little key in, in, in a jar, he's talking about the motion of charge from another, from one point to another. He's concerned about the ampage, which is that motion. He considers that to be the fundamental unit, the motion of charge. Okay? He doesn't necessarily believe that inside that, that, that thread that he's using as his uh, kite string, that there are fundamental charges just sitting there. He only sees the motion of charges, natural phenomenon. He sees lightning. He sees charge move from one point to another. He doesn't necessarily believe or gets it be, you know, into his head that these, uh, these charges exist without motion. Okay? So it's just one of those things that we're stuck with. We'll always be stuck with this, not unless we can, I mean, I guess we can convince the world that Pluto is no longer a planet. Maybe we can start petitioning, you know, for, uh, uh, international standards to say, hey, look, it's not an amp, it's a coulomb. A coulomb makes, men makes sense to me, not an amp. Anyway, another fundamental charge, look at it. It's the exact same behavior. Um, KQQ over R squared, GMM over R squared, okay? So we're looking at the exact same behavior between these two. It's another inverse square law. Okay? Here's, here's some really interesting things, though. This force right here, KQQ over R squared, is considerably more stronger than this force. Okay? The force of gravity is, is at the very bottom on the strength scale. It's, it's way down here. Like it's 10 to the negative 24th in power, what you're looking at, I think, to the 16th here or may I could be wrong you'll have to check that for yourself considerably stronger than this one but don't we consider probably the gravity the strongest force in the universe everything is affected by the force of gravity right well it's psychological the reason why we consider this to be a strong force in the universe is because there's no repulsive unit it's mass and mass we just have mass has anybody played with negative mass We've played with negative charge. As a matter of fact, we do that all the time. We play with positive charge. We do that all the time. I mean, there's a, a re, an attraction and a repulsion here. You can achieve a sense of equilibrium between those forces. Okay? Two charges can be, can be forced to stay in a point. Gravitational doesn't necessarily work that way. Gravitational is always pulling. Always pulling. Never repelling. Well, never, never say never, I guess. There is some, some information out there that are talking about exotic matter that, that it's leading us to believe that there may be a negative mass value in the universe. But until somebody builds a coffee table out of it, you know, yeah, what are we going to do? Which would be really cool. I mean, that's one thing that drives me crazy is people talk about, oh, let's build an anti-gravity machine. You can't overcome gravity. That's like building an, an anti-electrostatic machine. Nobody builds an anti-electrostatic machine. We just achieve equilibrium by bringing in more charges. Don't build an anti-gravity machine. Build an anti-mass machine. That anti-mass, that negative mass value, would achieve the exact same thing. But I just wanted to quickly talk about these two forces. Anyway, tangent time. So anyway, um, we're going to talk about uh, fields, what they look like, and then we're going to talk about potential and then potential energy and then we'll be done with modern forces.